club has so many extraordinary members. Um, it's a joy to finally introduce one of us as our featured speaker today. John Jonas is a mechanical engineer who is obsessed with how to make things work. This passion has led him to explore how the human body responds to altitude and how the body's performance at altitude can be improved. He's going to tell us um, today a little bit about what he's learned in that regard. Originally from Massachusetts, John moved to Boulder seven years ago with his wife Jody and son Jake after 20 years in Southeast Asia. Soon after arriving here, he founded Mountain Air Cardio, an organization that helps elite athletes and, and mountaineers improve their cardio performance at altitude. John has been a member of Boulder Rotary since 2018. On any given weekend, um, including this coming weekend, if you can believe it, uh, John can be found volunteering as a ski instructor um, or mountain biking or rock climbing or just enjoying our beautiful mountains. Please give a warm welcome to John Jonas. Thanks very much, David, for that very kind intro. Uh, it's good to be back. Um, we're going to be talking about something near and dear to my heart, uh, being altitude. Uh, and this is really the reason I moved to Colorado from Singapore. Um, I love playing in places like on this title slide here. Um, you know, whether it's skiing or mountaineering or rock climbing, uh, it's sort of what makes me tick. And uh, I feel like I have this pent up energy from being in Singapore. And so it's great to finally be here in Colorado to be able to take advantage of everything that, all the cool things that we have here. Uh, just a little bit of a disclaimer, I'm not a doctor, um, but I've spent a long time uh, learning about altitude and how it works and how it affects the body. Um, so I've got a few things to say about it. So uh, one of my misconceptions about altitude is I thought that the oxygen percentage went down as you went up. Uh, but that's not really true. Uh, right here in this room, we're breathing 21% oxygen, and that's the same at sea level, and that's the same if you're on the summit of Mount Everest. Uh, what's different is that as we go up in altitude, the barometric pressure goes down. So if you multiply the barometric pressure times the partial pressure, uh, sorry, times the barometric pressure times 21%, you get the partial pressure of oxygen, and that's what goes down. So as you go up, you're actually breathing fewer and fewer molecules of oxygen with each breath, okay? So even here at Boulder, uh, we're at about a 15% oxygen deficit. Um, by the time you get up on the summit of Mount Everest, you're, at, you're only breathing about a third of the oxygen that you'd be breathing at sea level, which is why it's so terrible up there. So 21%, sea level all the way up to the top. When you fly, you know, I get a lot of questions about flying, and um, if you're on one of the older airframes, uh, like the Boeing 73 or the 777 Airbus A320, uh, they pressurize those cabins to about 8,000 feet. Um, if you're on one of the newer models, uh, like the Boeing Dreamliner 787 or the A350 or the Airbus A380, that's the big double-decker uh, airplane, uh, they pressurize that to 6,000 feet, so just at a higher pressure. Uh, so those planes tend to be much more comfortable when you're on a long-haul flight. Um, you just... You, you, you're not as high of an altitude, you tend to sleep better on those planes than you will on the older planes. Um, so one of the problems with playing at altitude is that you can get uh, acute mountain sickness, or AMS. And that's defined as 
having a headache, number one, you have to have a headache to have AMS, plus one of the following other symptoms. Uh, so it could include uh, loss of appetite, nausea, dizziness, or the one that really affects me is uh, sleep disturbance. Uh, I was just up at Uncle Bud's hut on Monday night, and I had a lousy sleep because I wasn't acclimatized to the 11,400 feet where Uncle Bud's hut is outside of Leadville. Uh, so you can have any of these. Um, you might recognize these symptoms uh, if you had uh, a bit too much wine. Uh, it's, it's very much hangover-like, um, and um, it's, it's, it's very unpleasant. Uh, and then interestingly, it doesn't kick in right away when you get to altitude. There's this delayed onset that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so this chart is not very surprising. It's just telling you that the higher you go in elevation, the more likely you are to get AMS. And uh, this study was done with a bunch of US military personnel where they airlifted them from sea level to these various elevations. And as you can see, once you get over 14,000 feet, almost everybody got some form of AMS. And the black bit on that, uh, on that graph is severe AMS. Um, at elevations like here in the front range, um, you can get AMS, but it's, it's not very common. Uh, this graph here is a little less intuitive to me. Um, what this is telling us is that these same US uh, uh, service personnel were airlifted to 10,000 feet. And they saw, OK, who got AMS and who didn't? Well, it turns out that you almost have like this physiological memory of how to deal with hypoxia or how to deal with altitude. And if you've spent, um, say as many as 14 days in the last 60 days at altitude, there's almost zero chance that you'll get AMS uh, because your body sort of builds this memory of how to respond to hypoxia. Uh, conversely, if you haven't been up at altitude in the last couple months, uh, you know, more than a third of these uh, personnel uh, got symptoms of AMS. So I mentioned the delayed onset earlier, and uh, probably many of you have experienced this, uh, or you've had guests experience it, people who are coming in from the coast, from sea level, and you know, maybe they've uh, flown into DIA and they drive up to Summit County, and they feel fine at first. Um, and then, like, oftentimes up to like a day after having arrived, that's when it really kicks in, and that's where they feel lousy. Um, but if they can tough it out until day two, 48 hours later, the symptoms tend to, uh, tend to abate. And so a lot of people think, oh, that means I'm acclimatized, and that means that my body's produced all these red blood cells, and now I can deal with altitude better. Um, that's not what actually happens. Um, this was also new to me, but there's, the body has this acute response to altitude where it reduces the volume of plasma in your bloodstream. And it comes out as urine, and you, know, you tend to pee more when, you, uh, when you're at altitude compared to being at lower elevations. And so what happens then is that if you look at your blood, if you remove some of the plasma, you're left with a higher concentration of red blood cells. So for every pump of the heart, you're moving more red blood cells through your body, and so you get more efficient at getting oxygen to your muscle and brain tissue. Um, so sort of an interesting acute response. It doesn't mean that you've acclimatized, but that's how your body deals with it in the short term. So uh, what are the risks for AMS? Um, odds are if you've gotten it before and you go quickly to above 9,000 feet, you're going to get AMS. Uh, if you're above 10,000 feet and you're ascending at a rate of more than 1,500 feet per day, you're probably going to get AMS. 
Uh, Kilimanjaro is a, is a real popular climb. Uh, Non-mountaineers can do it, uh, but it's incredibly high. It's uh, just shy of 20,000 feet. And for those who do it in less than seven days, there's a very good chance you're going to get AMS. This one's kind of weird. Um, if you're under 50 years old, you have a higher chance of getting AMS. Uh, in fact, on Kilimanjaro, if you look at the uh, failure rate of different demographics, the highest failure rate of summiting Kilimanjaro are males between the ages of 20 to 30. They tend to go faster. They tend to maybe not listen to the advice of the guide. Uh, <laughs> they tend to not take uh, altitude medication. Um, just basically being kind of stupid, like I was when I was in my 20s and 30s. Uh, maybe a little bit today, too. Uh, so yeah, so uh, that's sort of an interesting one. Uh, obesity is a factor uh, for getting AMS. Uh, lung disease, that's not a big surprise. If you have trouble getting uh, oxygen into your bloodstream when you're at sea level, you're going to have even a harder time at elevation. And then physical ex exertion as well. Uh, if you're working hard, like my two buddies here, we're skinning up towards uh, Peter Eston Hut. Uh, we're above 11,000 feet here. Um, the more oxygen used to send to your muscles, um, it's going to make it worse. And so it's advisable to take it easy for the first couple days uh, after arriving at altitude. And weirdly, gender, age, physical fitness levels, none of those are good indicators of uh, who gets altitude sickness and who doesn't, with the exception of the 20 to 30 year olds on Kili. Um, and we don't really know why that is. And there's no like test you can take ahead of going to a mountain expedition or something that's going to tell you uh, whether you're going to get it or not. Um, and everybody responds differently to altitude. Uh, you could be fit and young and be very much prone to altitude sickness, or you could be older and less fit and have no problem at altitude. There's just no way that we know today to predict that. So if you get it, then what? Uh, well, Going down works like a miracle, and it's instant. Uh, if you're up at, at Dillon Dam and feeling lousy, even just driving down to Idaho Springs, you're going to feel better. And by the time you get home, you're going to feel 100% normal. It is like that quick that, uh, that the effect is. Uh, supplemental oxygen can help. And I'm not talking about you know, those little cylinders you buy at the gas station. Um, though, don't waste your money on that. The volume of oxygen in those things is so tiny, it might help you for like a few minutes, but it's, it's a total waste. When I say supplemental oxygen, I mean like an oxygen concentrator at a hospital or those big, huge green uh, cylinders of oxygen that you can breathe off of for a long time. Ibuprofen can help, Advil. Um, Diamox or acetazolamide, that is uh, sort of a preventive one that you start taking a day or two before going to the mountains. And that sort of tricks your body into breathing more quickly. And so when you breathe more quickly, you're getting more oxygen into your system. Uh, so that can be effective for a lot of people. It is a diuretic, so it makes you pee more often. So some people don't like it, especially if they're uh, tent camping. Uh, dexamethasone, or DEX, uh, this is something I always take with me in my first aid pack. Uh, it has a little bit more punch than Diamox, and um, it is incredibly effective at alleviating uh, mountain sickness symptoms. Uh, so another way that, uh, that my athletes and the mountaineers uh, that I work with uh, deal with AMS uh, is uh, with altitude tents uh, to pre-acclimatize before they go. So these are called normal barrack hypoxic tent. 
So normobaric is just a fancy name for normal pressure. So they're not hyperbaric or hypobaric. Uh, they're normal pressure, normobaric. Um, and then hypoxia or hypoxic just means low oxygen. So it's sort of the reverse of real altitude. With real altitude, you keep the, the oxygen percentage the same, and then the pressure drops as you go up. With an altitude tent, we keep the pressure the same, but we drop the altitude. Uh, sorry, we drop the oxygen percentage. The net effect is the same. So if you're at 10,000 feet versus a simulated altitude of 10,000 feet in a normobaric hypoxic tent, you're breathing the same number of molecules of oxygen with every breath. So it has a very similar, almost exactly the same effect. Uh, the way we do that is we pump hypoxic air uh, into a tent, then we measure the oxygen percentage inside there once every 10 seconds, and then there's a ventilation fan that dilutes the hypoxic air to dial in the altitude uh, that you want. Um, and so this is my little invention here um, in how we control the altitude inside the tent. Uh, we have a hypoxic air generator, which is very similar to an oxygen concentrator, but instead of peeling off the oxygen, we take off the high nitrogen content air. Pump that into a tent. There's a sensor and a controller and some fancy electronics in there. And then it controls a ventilation fan that dilutes the hypoxic air into the tent so that you get the altitude that you want. It's kind of cool. Uh, that's what it looks like. That's in my guest bedroom. Um, <laughs> So the, it goes right over your bed, the mattress goes in the tent with you, and uh, yeah, it's, you're in a tent. Um, it's important to maintain a slow rate of ascent, and this is something that an altitude tent is nice over real altitude, because it's tough to go up 500 to 1,000 feet per night. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to you know, stop in Idaho Springs, and then in Georgetown, and then, you know, it's, it's just not practical. Uh, but it's easy to do in an altitude tent. And as, as we're doing this, we're looking at qualitative metrics. So doing like a self-check-in in the morning, like how did I feel last night? Where, was I tossing and turning all night? If the answer is yes, you probably went too high too fast and you need to slow it down or even back up a little bit. Uh, we also look at quantitative metrics. Uh, one of the most important is your sleep quality. So we look at the number of minutes of REM sleep and deep sleep versus light sleep. And if any of those numbers have decreased over your baseline, you've gone too high too fast. Uh, we'll also check you know, the little fingertip pulse oximeter things that tell your oxygen percentage. We'll look at those. Um, we're sort of shooting for to be in like the high 80s. Like here in this room now, probably everybody's in the high 90s, 97, 98, 99. Um, but inside the tent, you're shooting for high 80s because that's what you need to trigger the physio physiological responses to altitude. Um, does anybody here measure heart rate variability? Anyone? No? Um, it's sort of a new metric that a lot of elite athletes are looking at. And what it is, is, uh, so here's your heartbeat, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Um, we measure the time in milliseconds between each heartbeat. And counterintuitively, at least to me, is that if you have a high variation in the time between heartbeats, like shown here, that's a sign of health. If you have very regular heart rate intervals, that's a sign of unhealthiness, and, and that could be caused by training too hard, it could be caused by drinking, it could be caused by stress at work, uh, it could be caused uh, by altitude. And so, and it's, it's sort of the canary in the coal mine, it's a super accurate and easy way to see if your body is stressed for any reason. And so we use it for uh, altitude training because if HRV drops, that's usually the first thing that's going to drop. Um, and so we're trying to maintain baseline HRV as we're going up. So it's at a nice slow rate of ascent. 
And there's a bunch of different devices out there in the market that do this. Garmin, Apple, uh, Whoop is sort of the pioneer in HRV. If you go to Whoop's website, there's all sorts of great articles if you're interested on HRV uh, and what it means and why it works. We could do a whole nother presentation just on our HRV. It's, uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, Aura Ring is another one. There's probably some others out there. They all work basically the same. So for these mountaineers um, looking to pre-acclimatize, we generally start them uh, 3,000 feet above their home elevation. Most people are living at, uh, uh, at sea level, so we're starting them at 3,000. Uh, that 3,000 foot jump is not a big deal when you're starting at sea level going to three. It's just not much difference. But if you're at 9,000 and you're going to 12,000, that's a huge jump. Um, so we'll start them at 3,000 feet above. And then uh, for them, they're training hard. So they can only go up about 500 feet per night and maintain their baseline metrics. For normal people like you and me, um, we can go up faster, like 1,000 feet per night. Again, that's sort of counterintuitive. You think these super fit people can go up faster, but they're training so hard, their body is stressed. And so they can't handle the additional stress of altitude as well as we can. And so what that looks like, if you look at this graph here on the right, uh, this was a recent night I was in the tent. I had already acclimatized to 10,000 feet. So I started here at Boulder Elevations. You turn it on. It goes up to 10,000 feet where you spend the night. And then you wake up, turn it off, and it drops back down uh, to your ambient elevation. Maximum of about 10 to 12,000 feet. At elevations greater than that, there's not really much additional benefit in terms of the physiological response or what it's going to do for your cardio performance. And it can actually hurt you because uh, we can't acclimatize to elevations greater than 12,000 feet. Um, certain people who live in Bolivia and Ecuador or in Nepal or Tibet, they can more so than we can. Um, but it can actually... Uh, cause you to go backwards, because above those elevations, your sleep becomes poor, and then you don't recover, and your physical performance starts to decline. Um, so we never go above 12,000 feet. And they'll do it, say, like one to two weeks before uh, going on an expedition to shorten the amount of time that they're on the hill and during sleeping hours. Uh, so we can think of acclimatization as being in like two different buckets. So we just talked about the first bucket, uh, which happens pretty quickly, you know, sort of preparing your body so that you don't get AMS. And that happens in like one to two weeks of pre-acclimatization. Uh, the second bucket is improving your cardio performance. So this takes a bit longer, like four, six, or even eight weeks. And this is where the red blood cells come into effect and the hemoglobin mass. Uh, it just takes a lot longer to have your cardio performance uh, be improved, um, being at altitude. So this brings to the second category of athletes that we work with, which are the cardio athletes. So cyclists, and runners, and swimmers. Uh, just before coming to the meeting today, I was talking to a, a guy who's doing a UFC fight. Um, uh, that's like a mix of aerobic and anaerobic. Um, but the protocols for that are so that you have the same one to two weeks of ascent, gradual ascent. You have the same ceiling of 10 to 12,000 feet for the same reasons. And then it results in like a single digit increase to your hemoglobin mass. And for you and for me, that's not going to make that much of a difference. Uh, but if you're performing at an elite level, like that's the difference between being on the podium versus being an also ran. Uh, it also increases your cellular mitochondrial density. Uh, so hypoxia affects every single cell in the body, from your muscles to your brain, to your bones, everything. And the mitochondria are the little bits inside each cell that convert fuel into energy. So if you have more of that, then your body gets more efficient at processing oxygen. So I'll close with uh, just some, some tips for playing at altitude, uh, my greatest passion. 
Um, first one's obvious, don't go too high too fast. It's just so tempting to do, especially if you're in good shape. Uh, avoiding overexertion, like my two buddies skinning uphill at Peter Eston Hut. Don't do that. Uh, lay off the booze and sleeping pills. Uh, these are both respiratory suppressants, so they cause you to breathe more slowly. So it's like the opposite of diamox or acetazolamide. Um, so last thing you want to do when you're at altitude is breathe more slowly. You're going to get less oxygen. You're going to be more inclined to get AMS. Know the limitations of each person in your group. So this is their physical limitations, and it's also where they came from. Um, this photo here is Broom Hut. Uh, that's up by Birth at Pass uh, at like 11,000 something feet. Don't bring your East Coast visitors here on their first day. Uh, don't get stuck in an altitude trap. Uh, so an altitude trap is when you go up a hill and then you come down and you're in this like upper valley that in order to get out, you have to go up. If you have AMS and you have to go up to get out, that's really bad. So don't do that. Uh, take the recommended safety and first aid gear. So in addition to the normal first aid kit, especially in Colorado, safety gear at this time of year, right through the end of June, we're looking at avalanche danger. So that's beacon, shovel, probe, avalanche airbag, and have the training on how to use it. Have a way to communicate outside of cell phone range. As we all know, you drive 10 minutes out of Boulder, you got nothing. Um, I use this cool little device. It's a little Garmin inReach. It's a satellite communication device. That allows me to send text messages to uh, emergency services. If I'm running late, it, I can text my wife and tell her I'm running late so she's not worried. Um, and all my uh, uh, play buddies have these as well. And so we can text each other via satellite from device to, to device. There's a bunch of different models on the market. I like that one because it's so tiny and uh, light. And then lastly, checking the local weather and avalanche forecasts. Uh, and when I say local, I mean like hyper-local. Um, and for hyper-local forecasts, I've done a ton of research in this area. And does anybody know Joel Gratz with Open Snow? Anybody follow Open Snow? Yeah. So um, he's a Colorado meteorologist, uh, passionate skier, and he was upset that Nobody offered good weather forecasts for the mountains. And on open snow, either their, uh, their phone app or their website, you can pull up a map, pick a point on the map, and get the point forecast, which gives you not only the long longitude and latitude of that point, but also the altitude. And as we all know, uh, weather changes drastically with altitude. And so that way you can get a very localized forecast. And I've found his to be really predictable. And then lastly, uh, the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, CAIC. Um, I, I look at this every single day and just watch for the trends and the AVI conditions. And if it's high avalanche risk, I know I need to stay off of slopes greater than 29 degrees and also to stay away from areas that have overhead exposure to slopes greater than 29 degrees. So with that, I am happy to take your questions. Thank you, John. Very informative. Um, we hear all the time the term at, at altitude. Would you define that term? So high altitude is defined as 2,000 meters or 6,600 feet above sea level. Um, in reality, as I mentioned before, altitude affects everybody differently. So the way altitude affects you is going to be different than me. But sort of like the textbook version, definition is 2,000 meters. Great. Hey, Danny. So in your use and, and research of hypoxic altitude tents, um, have you explored uh, 
you know, it, it's stressing the body, and uh, have you ever studied uh, how it might benefit weight loss? Yeah, so that is uh, another consequence of being at altitude. And um, one of the physiological responses is that your metabolism increases, your resting metabolic rate. And so uh, if you compare the amount of calories that you burn at, say, Summit County versus at sea level, it's to the tune of 500 calories per day. Multiply that in a week, that's 3,500, and that's about a pound of fat per week that you lose when you're at altitude. And so uh, many of our customers, they're, you know, they're these elite cardio athletes. You know, they're like this thin, and they can't afford to lose that kind of weight. So they have to uh, bump their caloric intake just so that they can maintain weight when they're altitude training. Um, I guess the flip side of that is, it's an easy way for somebody who doesn't want to exercise to lose weight. <laughs> Great. It, it seems like uh, your process is a little bit like doping. It's not doping, but uh, there are rules against doping. Are there any rules uh, against using this process for sports? Yeah, so um, uh, this sort of altitude simulation was new about 20 years ago. And, um, and the, uh, about 15 years ago, the World Anti-Doping Association, WADA, had a look at it. And they have signed off on it as completely legal uh, for the Olympics or for any professional sporting event. And the reason they made that decision is because the effect is the same as if you were to go to altitude. And so they saw it as sort of a leveling of the playing field because you had some athletes who could afford to go to altitude and train at altitude, um, but many couldn't, uh, but they could do this. And so it's more of a leveling of the playing field. Great. Uh, we have a question online from Bill Anderson. Thanks for coming to speak with us, John. Sorry I'm not there in person, but I don't think anybody wants the germs that I have right now. Um, I, I was just curious how, um, how much altitude can you simulate with the tent, and what altitude do you sleep at? Yeah, thanks for the question, Bill. Um, so if I'm training for a big expedition or something, I, I will only sleep at that 10 to 12,000 feet because anything above that, my sleep quality and everybody's sleep quality starts to decline. Um, when you uh, couple these uh, hypoxic air generators with a training mask, like a hypoxic training mask for in intermittent hypoxic training, you can actually go as high as 21,000 feet. Uh, not that you would, because that would really suck, and it hurts, and it's just lousy. Um, but uh, w if you're intermittent hypoxic training, you're sort of going for like the low 80s on your pulse ox uh, through the little fingertip meter. Um, and that stimulates a whole other set of physio physiological responses that are similar to sleeping with altitude, just slightly different. Um, but yeah, so I might do intermittent hypoxic training to 15,000 feet, sleeping at 10 to 12. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, John. My daughter came here a couple of years ago, and we spent a week in, up in Breckenridge, and she got very a, a severe case of AMS, and she was going every day to one of their oxygen cafes, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, she quickly conquered that problem and just got back from climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, believe it or not. But I'm still just curious as to your view of the utility of these, using these oxygen cafes, which we teased her about and thought it was a bit of a racket, but what's your view of uh, how they come in handy? The short answer is yes, it's a bit of a racket. Um, it's sort of like the little things you buy, the oxygen things you buy at the gas station. Uh, it will give you some immediate relief, and especially if you have a headache, oftentimes people find that while they're in the oxygen bar at these ski resorts like Breck, uh, they do get some instant relief. But then they walk out of the oxygen bar and within an hour, they're right back where they started. 
Um, some people report wonderful successes through these. But remember that delayed onset graph that we showed, that it peaked at 24 hours, and then by the time you get to 48 hours, all your symptoms are gone? Well, it's usually somewhere around the 24-hour mark that they walk into the oxygen bar hurting. And so they get that immediate short-term relief, but then also your body is just doing its thing and it's causing those symptoms to go away. So they might credit the oxygen bar for doing that, but it didn't really help. It's, it's really your own physiology that took over and made it better. So John, um, as you well know, Rotary always gets the last word, but this is sort of awkward because you are a Rotarian. So I'm going to do my last word as opposed to just the Rotarian. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank you so much because not only was this informative, but you were a great speaker, um, which always helps. And, um, you know, we, we tend to think that, that altitude training is only for those that want to be elite athletes. But today I think you gave us real insight into what each of us needs to be aware of. Many of you have either experienced altitude sickness or been a witness to it, and it is not pleasant. Um, so thank you very much for that. And to show our appreciation, I know you know this already, um, but we want to uh, donate 100 doses of polio vaccine to the Polio Plus program in your honor. Um, and as you know, it's almost there. We've almost conquered it. So thank you very much for today. Okay, thank you. <laughs>